Matthew W. Kent. I'm the author of Harbor Defenses and San Francisco a Field Guide, 1890 to 1950. And today I'm standing from the entranceway to the North Channel mine casement here at Fort Berry, otherwise known as MC1. It appears this uh, facility was shot by Mr. Surfing on YouTube uh, quite some time ago. And today we're going to go ahead and take a tour inside and get the real lowdown on this facility. So come on and let's go inside. So we're here in the entrance corridor, uh, the dugout facility. You can still see the original electronic uh, uh, electric cable uh, conduit for the uh, electrical lights uh, here inside uh, MC1. And if we go down we're in the entrance corridor, and the only way to get inside the facility currently is through this window, so we're gonna go ahead and go in through here. Okay, right now we're standing inside the uh, cot room, inside the MC1 mine case from here at Fort Berry. And what I'd like to do right now is explain briefly the uh, form and function of the mine uh, casement. Uh, this particular structure held the firing controls for the mine for a portion thereof. It's the most heavily protected structure of the mine defense facilities. In the 1800s, mine casements were sometimes located inside a reinforced casement of older fortification, hence the name mine casement. In the 1890s, mine casements were located in poorly ventilated concrete vaults built into hillsides. The mine casements held the control or operating doors, which held the master switches and or boxes for the individual mines and the batteries that powered the system. After the turn of the century, the mine casements were larger structures built of, con built of brick or concrete with windows for better ventilation. The structure was divided into separate rooms for the operating board power equipment, storage batteries, and a ready room. Casements were redesigned again in, in the 1910s with the construction of the roomier wood frame buildings which, protected, which were protected by concrete reinforced hillsides to the ocean side. The men manning the casement were under the command of a casement electrician. Equipment in the 1930s casement included a five kilowatt gasoline generator set or a Hornsbury alkali oil engine and generator, storage batteries, motor, motor generators, the casement transformer, power panel, interrupter panel, and operating boards. The minefield can be maintained in different modes of activation from the control panel in the main casement. An off position kept the mines inactive and allowed all vessels to pass without harm. Test position provided a low voltage DC current for all components of the minefield to perform its electrical integrity and signal, which allowed indication of electrical lights in the case of where the mine's ball switch was tripped by contract with a passing vessel. Contract fire, a passing vessel caused a pulse of high voltage AC current to detonate the mine. Delayed contact fire, a trip mine would detonate under the vessel by high voltage AC current after a time delay, an observation or a command fire in which a selected mine was detonated by high voltage AC current by throwing a switch in the mine casement on command. Okay, from the right of the cot room, we're now inside the power room. And we can see the remnants of two ventilation blowers mounted on the ceiling, along with electrical conduit lines for electrical purposes to power and provide light to the facility. Uh, on the floor here, we can still see the concrete mounts for various equipment that would have been mounted inside the power room, along with cable trenches on the floor, which are currently uncovered, to provide electrical power throughout the facility. If we make our way back out the door, into the cot room, and once again, now we're inside the uh, cotton room inside the MC1 mine casement here at Fort Berry. We can look on the wall. Correctly, the 12 o'clock position is a gas proof closure vent. And if there had been a gas attack, this would have been uh, closed shut to provide a gas tight environment here inside the facility. 
To the left of the cot room, we have the remnants of the water heater that was provided for this facility to provide hot water. And the grand total would be 24 personnel inside the facility at one time. And we can still see much of the heavy duty electrical cabling duct on top of the ceiling. Now, if we make our way back into the main part of the mine casement here, we can see the latrine area, which would have had a uh, toilet, which is now demolished, along with a wash basin area uh, over here. And directly behind this, with a hot water heater inside that room, would have been a shower room. <clears throat> now we're inside the main command and control portion of the mine casement here at Fort Berry MC1 mine casement. This is the operating room for the facility. Once again, we can see electrical conduits coming from the junction box. They're still on the wall. Over here, over here. We have a cable trench as well. Uncovered. And we can go back on the main wall and identify two more gas proof closures uh, for the facility that would shop fence on the roof of the of the building. And if we make our way towards the airlock room, uh, once again, there are gas curve closure right here. Leaves the vent outside, outside on top of the ceiling. And if we make our way into the airlock room, we can see the remnants of much of the gas proofing machinery still inside the facility. And it looks like the uh, air blowers were built by the Buffalo Forge Company in Buffalo, New York. We have a blower unit here, and we also have an additional blower unit over here. And once again, this would have provided gas uh, proofing to the facility, providing a gas proof environment for 24 personnel at one given period of time. And it's still going to be steel outside door to the main corridor, which is currently welded shut, providing zero access into the facility through this way. But according to notations outside of the door, it appears that this facility may have been used all the way up until the 1970s as a protected gas proof facility for biological, chemical, or radiological attack for personnel that were stationed at SF 88L, which was a Nike missile launching facility directly to the north here over a point Benita. And they had administrative facilities to the left of this complex for launching personnel in an event of an attack. They may have used this as a protected gas proof biological radiological proof facility. And again, there was a notation outside that says CBR, personal capacity, 75 personnel. So there's a high probability that this particular facility was used during the Nike missile era. So this is pretty much, this is pretty much it. We can still see a lot of the, the air duct piping still intact. Again, gas proof closures. Storage shelves are in a state of uh, disrepair. And again, we're back into the heart and soul of the NC1 minefield North Channel mine casement. And again, another beautiful example of gas proof closures, electrical conduit line, and we also have the associated air duct work to provide a forced air throughout the facility. OK, 
Okay, we're going to show you another tour of the MC1 mine casement here at Fort Berry at Point Benita. I'd like to go ahead and take this time to tell you that once again, my name is Matthew W. Kent, author of Harbor Defenses and San Francisco Field Guide, 1890-1950. Please feel free to look at the URL link here on the YouTube page to the link to my book, Harbor Defenses and San Francisco Field Guide, 1890-1950. Once again, I hope you enjoyed this video, and please take a look at my YouTube page for more exciting videos like this posted online. Have a good one.